Good afternoon. So, VAT, there's the agenda. Let's kick off with the uh, Office of Tax Simplification Review. This was a report which was issued uh, towards the end of last year. Um, I think it's uh, interesting and, and important. It's a, a view into the future of how VAT may look. This is the first full-scale review of the VAT system since VAT was introduced in 1973. So it's been a long time coming. We've had uh, a number of uh, tweaks to the system, but not a full-scale review. What I wanted to do, though, is to look at what was said, what was recommended, which may come in over the next five years. It might be slightly longer, given that we've got uh, a bit of a stalemate on Brexit. Um, but let's look at how it might how these recommendations might affect charities. First point is to do with HMRC guidance. I think in summary, the report effectively says, come on HMRC, get your act together. Let's get the, uh, the changes in your policy, the important court cases. Um, let's get the guidance that you issue to your officers, i.e. your internal manuals, updated a little bit more quickly with clarity um, at the moment, we tend to have um, a delay in the, in the update of information, um, which, of course, is not ideal when you have officers and, indeed, taxpayers relying on that information. Um, you may also have conflict in, in the internal manuals where you have one bit that's been updated, the other that, that has not. So clarity and responsive, uh, responsiveness is what is needed. Second point is to do with uh, penalties. We all make mistakes. Human error will occur. Uh, and of course, what you, like any other businesses, want to do is to voluntarily disclose your error to HMRC, uh, which is fine. But it, I think people generally have found that uh, there's, again, a lack of clarity in terms of what will happen to them if they do disclose the error. What will the penalty position be? Um, and it really does, at the moment, depend on how the particular officer uh, deals with it on a particular day. So some certainty is needed. Perhaps that might go far, uh, so far as saying if it's voluntarily disclosed then we should go back to there being no penalty. But we will see. The release review was looking more interesting I thought um, but if we reach a bit of a stalemate on Brexit, if we don't have a hard Brexit uh, we may be forced to maintain the position uh, uh, that we're in at the moment, which is that we can't introduce, under EU law, we can't introduce um, more zero-rated relief for charities. We can't be more lenient in that respect. Um, but you never know. Yeah, there could be, uh, there's the possibility that we may, um, we may have some of that in future. The recommendation was that the schedule of reliefs, so we have exempt uh, items in, in the exempt schedule, such as education, uh, health, care, that sort of thing. Um, we've got the zero rate of reliefs, uh, such as children's clothes, uh, such as um, food, and also perhaps donated goods sold by charities. Those are in the zero rate of reliefs. And then we've got the reduced rates for fuel and power for qualifying use. That includes use by a charity for non-business purposes of a building. Um, and, and domestic uh, conversions. So the, the recommendation is that the reliefs are reviewed because some of them I think are a little bit antiquated, um, old fashioned, and they need to be updated in line with current, um, current government policy. Give you an example, picture this. This is to do with um, clothing, children's clothing. So articles designed as clothing or footwear for young children and not suitable for older persons will be zero rated. So that's really quite simple, isn't it? But here are the clarifying notes. Clothing includes hats and other headgear. It doesn't include articles of clothing made wholly or partly of fur skin, except headgear, gloves, buttons, belts, and buckles. Any garment merely trimmed with fur skin, unless the trimming has an area greater than one fifth of the area of the outside <laughs> material, or in the case of a new garment, represents a cost of the manufacturer greater than the cost to him of the other components. Fur skin means any skin with fur, hair, or wool attached, 
except rabbit skin, wool, sheep, <laughs> I thought they had wool, um, lamb skin, and the skin, if neither tanned nor dressed, of bovine cattle, including buffalo, equine animals, goats, or kids, other than Yemen, Mongolian, and Tibetan goats, <laughs> swine, including peccary, of course, chamois, gazelle, deer, or dogs. And that's so I have a picture of a sort of a, a 1970s when the bat was introduced, a young, young child running around in a fur coat and buckle. Um, perhaps it does need to be updated. Um, next comes to partial exemption. So this is where your charity undertakes both taxable and exempt activities, and so it can only recover the VAT relating to its taxable activities if it's registered, not the exempt. There is what's called a de minimis threshold. Um, so that means that if you fall under £7,500 of exempt VAT in each year, then you can just claim it all back. There's no need to restrict your VAT. But that threshold has been in place for over 20 years, as has the capital goods scheme threshold. Now, capital goods scheme is where you spend VAT, you, you incur VAT on costs in excess of £250,000 on buying building or refurbishing a property that you, you hold. And in that case, you have to review the VAT you originally recover over a 10-year period and adjust for any fluctuation in taxable or exempt use over the period, or indeed non-business use as well. That has also uh, stayed still for 20 years. So the report quite rightly says it's about time that was, uh, that was updated and perhaps in, increased in line with inflation. Then we have um, a look at businesses, possibly charities, that do these partial exemption calculations, but why? It's frankly not, it's not relevant, it's not important, and they shouldn't really have to do it. Uh, so that's a recommendation, there's no calculations if the insignificant exempt income, if there's insignificant exempt income. Then we come to special method applications. So the standard way of working out your partial exemption overhead VAT recovery is based on income. Taxable income over taxable plus exempt income. So quite straightforward, but it doesn't always create a, a fair result. And so if you wish, you can apply to HMRC to have approval for a special method. Um, in the past, there have been cases, I've had one, the worst case took nine years to agree. I had one which concluded last year which I picked up since joining, uh, since joining the firm, three years. Although more recently, the, the latest one, it took a couple of months. So you never know but the general feeling is that option, uh, special method application, the application process is uh, far, too, uh, uh, far too difficult and time consuming. So it needs to be easier. Don't say how that can happen, it's a recommendation that needs to happen. Um, and property and options to tax. So this is where you've got a commercial property that you rent out to tenants, and so to recover the VAT, you incur on your related maintenance, or even on if you've got the capital goods scheme running in the background, you may wish to opt to tax. That means that rather than having an exempt rent, you have a taxable rent and you get to recover your VAT. Um, but when, you come to, when it comes to things like a new tenant or a buyer, perhaps, who wants to see a, the acknowledgement of the option to tax, that's really difficult to, uh, to get hold of. HMRC at this time of year usually issue a statement saying uh, they've all gone on holiday and there's a 30 working day delay. Maybe a little bit harsh, but it certainly happened a couple of years ago and that was their reason. So the suggestion is why not have an online notification system? potentially then, I suppose, uh, a database that could be accessed more easily as well. The most interesting one, though, and I think this will have an impact, is to do with the registration threshold. The report says that it can't stay, really, at the level it is, which is £85,000 of taxable income. The EU average is £20,000, so we are really at the top. The problem with the 85 k is that that you get to that level and then you don't want to go above it. Because if you do, then you won't be competitive anymore. So there's that uh, bunching effect, that cliff edge over, over which nobody wishes to step. So it's artificially constraining businesses, the economy, and also the tax take. So the VAT take 
in 16 to 17 was 120 billion. It's going to be 130 billion, it's predicted, at the end of this financial year. So if it can't stay where it is, the OTS looked at what can happen. Should it go up, should it go down? Going up a little bit doesn't seem to have any impact. It's still that bunching effect if it's to 100, 120K, et cetera. So they looked at, well, what would happen if it were 500K? 500K for charities, I think, in general, would be good news. So less administration because charities would drop out of the back club. The suppliers to the charities, they would fall out of the back club as well. So maintenance of your properties, etc., could be performed by more unregistered suppliers. So there would be a saving there. And of course, it would reduce HMRC's uh, compliance of having to manage that number of uh, businesses and, and charities. So that, that sounds great, but we would lose three to six billion, which is why I don't think that is going to be an option for the government. However, if we look at what happens if we reduce it fairly significantly to, let's say, we'll halve it to around about 43K, then what's the impact of that? Well, 1.5 billion pounds extra comes in, which is good news if you're not looking to raise taxes, just adjust the threshold, yeah? And you need to spend it on something like the health service. So that is a possibility. They were thinking about perhaps introducing some sort of tapering system because it, it really would impact many, many uh, organisations, small businesses, suppliers to charities, so bad news, but charities that, uh, themselves as well. They, they were thinking of a tapering system whereby you get used to paying VAT over a three-year period. Um, that, I think, is perhaps the more likely direction for this. What now, though? Well, what should a charity be looking out for in terms of its income and its VAT registration threshold? Well, we have livery companies here. They may not be VAT registered. They may be uh, supplying administration, uh, management services, staff to their related associated charities. The, that is ordinarily a taxable supply, so that counts towards the registration threshold. So if the threshold reduces, that could create a cost. That could mean that the uh, livery company has to register for VAT, and it could mean that the charity it's associated with incurs VAT. That's just one example. But the biggest thing, I think, and I've mentioned this before, is to do with grants. What's the update here, you might say? You've mentioned it before. You keep banging on about this. Well, HMLC have finally, after many years, issued some guidance to their officers as to what should they be looking out for. How do you, what are the factors that contribute to something being a grant? What are the factors that contribute to something being a contract for services? To explain to you the difference. So, if you have a grant and that is the only thing that you receive to fund an activity, your activity will be non-business because you're not expecting money in return for what you do. You're just receiving a freely given grant. Non-business means no VAT recovery on your costs. The benefit, there is a benefit though, of something being non-business, and that is to do with um, the fuel and power you receive, so relevant charitable use being non-business use in a building. It also can have, have a benefit if you're building new buildings or relevant charitable annexes, where you can get the building work zero rated if you have non-business activities within the building and they're over 95%. But imagine if you don't spot that something is a grant and actually it's a contract for services. Well, not only have you got to decide is that a taxable contract or is it an exempt contract, taxable meaning you can get that back against the activity, exempt meaning you can't still, but both of those things would mean that your fuel and power then is perhaps no longer at 5% or it's reduced. From, you know, so you're, you're incurring more VAT. If it's exempt, you mean you won't be able to recover the value you, you incur on your fuel and power. It can also mean that you've got an issue with building new buildings. Perhaps you slip over the 5% business allowance uh, and suddenly the building cannot be zero rated. Uh, and you could have a nasty clawback in that respect. So grants are important. So large values, there's a material effect. There could also be a nasty registration issue. So if you're registered for that, you're probably aware 
HMRC can go back and clobber you over a four year period. There's a cap. Registration does not have that cap. So if you're not registered and you're receiving, let's say, £100,000 of grant income every year, but actually that's a contract, let's say you'd receive that for the last 10 years, then you would have to go back and register 10 years ago. You might be lucky and get that VAT back from your customer. So if it's a local authority, local authorities tend to be able to recover their VAT. So you might get that back and might give you a benefit in terms of your VAT recovery position. But it could also be just a set amount where you're not getting any more. No, we won't entertain the VAT that you owe, which then of course becomes a large exposure. I've mentioned the removal of the release if the activity is uh, business because it's a contract for services. Um, the other thing, it can have an impact on, for example, hospices. So local authorities, um, small or certain galleries and museums, academies and hospices, for example, have special refund uh, that they're allowed to recover VAT against their non-business activities. But if, they, if a hospice, for example, had a continuing care contract, which was a uh, was, you know, contract but exempt, then it would give them a VAT recovery problem because it wouldn't be a non-business activity anymore. I'm not going to go into the, I'm not going to read through all of these. What I suggest you do is take these away, compare and contrast with your, your grant funded activities that you think is a grant and say, well, here are the factors. Do we think we're ticking the boxes on this slide or on this slide, which are indications of something being contract? If you need then, if there's any clarity needed, then you can come and seek some help from a specialist. Moving on then to quickly to cost-sharing groups. So cost-sharing groups where, are where exempt or non-business entities collaborate, share, want to share services and costs to reduce costs in effect. Um, usually, the, the sharing of services is subject to VAT, which causes a cost in itself. The EU, however, has always had uh, in the EU directive an exemption for cost sharing. But HMRC didn't in, uh, introduce it, didn't implement it correctly until 2012. And when they did, they said, all right, okay, it's available, even though it's quite hard to implement, it's available for everybody. But the EU has recently challenged um, countries and indeed Aviva, etc., and said, no, there's a certain category in EU law where cost sharing is allowed and it's meant for, but that does not include banks, insurance companies, and even housing. So at the moment, HMRC has said, all right, we can't use that anymore for those sectors. It's only sort of education, health, welfare. So you should be okay. Um, but housing, I think they've, they've said, watch this space. The reason being is that housing nowadays does include support, care, as well as just housing. So they need to think about that. Now to VAT recovery. There is one case, the bottom case, University of Cambridge, which is an update. But let me just show you the way that the, the VAT recovery position is working, where it's sort of moved from and to over the years. You may have heard that, you know, when, when can we recover VAT? Well, it's whether or not you have the expenditure you incur has a direct and immediate link to a taxable business activity you know, and taxable income that you receive. And if that's the case, so if I buy this laptop and use it for a taxable consulting activity only, then I'd be able to recover all of that. If I used it for my exempt care activity only, then I wouldn't be able to recover the VAT. Um, and if it was an overhead, so it's a general office uh, cost, then I'd get a bit of it back depending on my activities. So BLP 1995 was where direct and immediate link came from, and that's what HMRC officers tend to rely on. But there are other cases which have pushed the boundaries. First one, Children's Society 2005. That looked at telemarketing costs. So VAT on telemarketeer uh, services who were raising funds for the charity. Um, the charity successfully argued that rather than looking at the income, the freely given income there as non-business, you should be looking at it as outside the scope of that and then seeing where is it spent. And if it helps fund, potentially, taxable business activities in part, then we should be recovering a part of our telemarketing VAT costs. 
They won, and there were lots of claims that went in at that time. So that was interesting, a concept of looking at uh, how the income is spent. Then we had Spader in 2015. Spader had a cafe shop in a public path, a, a public park. They built a pathway, 90% funded by the local authority, 10% by themselves, and recovered the VAT. Went through the courts, and the courts said, actually, yes, you can recover the VAT on the basis that it has a link to your operational activities, which are taxable. So yes, you can recover the VAT, which was interesting because it's not a direct and immediate link, which you would have thought would be to you know, the, the, the right, free right of access to the park. University of Cambridge won in the first tribunal. It was to do with investment, VAT on investment management fees um, and whether that was recoverable. It won in the, uh, the tribunals, got to the Court of Appeal. Uh, the court, court of Appeal, unfortunately, has... Uh, referred it to the ECJ, the European Court of Justice. Uh, and it's, it's done that because in Spader, the path had a direct link, had a link to the operational activities, whereas man investment management fees have a link to the non-operational activities. They pay for the overheads of the business, which include some taxable activities. So it's one step removed. So we have to wait to see what's happening there. And uh, finally, let's move on to a favourite subject. I know you're all prepared for making tax digital. Yeah, your software systems are all capable, compatible. Uh, no. <laughs> First of April 2019 is when your, your system, when your VAT return will need to be filed digitally. There will need to be a digital API link, which is application programming interface. I always forget that. It'll need to, be a, a lead to upload the information effectively digitally to HMRC's system. That's not the same as filing VAT returns online now, where you key in the box one to nine details. This means that once you've keyed in your invoices, etc., and made some journal adjustments, that will digitally flow through to HMRC's system. It's mandatory, it's a legal requirement, and it's coming in nine months' time, pretty much. There will be a few exceptions, as I mentioned there, but any VAT-registered entities over 85k taxable income will have to do that. So look at your software systems and check with your suppliers that they do meet the tests. However, HMRC, understand that it may not be that easy. You may be just preparing your VAT returns on spreadsheets at the moment. Um, so what they said, it will give you another year. So there's a soft landing, as it were, for a year, uh, and on penalties included. Um, so initially, you may perhaps give your information to Creston Reeves, who use its API-compatible software to digitally upload to HMRC system. That's OK for a year. But after a year, everything has to be digitally linked. Therefore, once you've keyed in your invoices, you know, it's all got to flow digitally. So summary, by next April, there needs to be API-enabled software, which is submitting VAT returns to HMRC. Um, the following April, there's a digital link between software and spreadsheets. One thing you may be asking is, how on earth will our system cope with partial exemption of business non-business methods, which effectively reduce the amount of VAT on your expenditure you can recover? The answer is, there's two, two ways. The first thing would be, HMRC is saying that you can digitally transfer the information, your purchase information out into another system, um, undertake the calculations there and digitally transfer it back into the system. That's one way. The other way, and the way I'd follow, is just to do a manual adjustment, a journal entry in effect. So look at your purchase listings, perform your calculation, work out how much VAT you can't recover, and put a manual journal entry in to the system, which can reduce your VAT recovery. That seems to me logical, easy. HMRC, and not at the moment, but I can see it going this way, um, delving down into your data and analysing whether you've got duplicate purchase invoices, etc., recovering too much VAT, unusual VAT amounts. Um, that may be coming in the future, but at the moment it's just an analysis of your boxes one to nine information. 
The whole reason for this is to reduce the manual, uh, manual keying in, so the possibilities of errors, whether you like it or not, that, that's what's happening. Um, and finally, penalties, points, points make prizes or in points make penalties. Rather like, I think that, well this is not in, in stone yet, but this is the way it's looking. It's rather like your driving license. If you speed, you get, you get some points. If you speed again, you get some more points. And eventually, you lose your license, or in this case, you get a penalty. So you can see here, this indicates that may have met one uh, in quarter two, but missed a number, finally got a penalty. Soft landing, but though, for the first year, but you know, need to not miss deadlines. Thank you.